Good evening. I'm glad that you could make it out this evening. We are in Acts and we are covering in a different direction some of the same scriptures that we looked at last week. At the end of chapter 4, we read of the contribution being collected and the, the institution of that for the church. And tonight, while we won't specifically talk about giving, we are going to look at the, the story around what is happening with the giving here. So let's start reading in verse 32 of Acts chapter 4, and we'll read just inside of chapter 5. Now the full now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own but they had everything in common and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all there was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles feet and it was distributed to each as any had need thus Joseph who was called by the apostles Barnabas which means son of encouragement a Levite a native of Cyprus sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles feet but a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart, and you have not lied to man, but to God? When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men arose and wrapped him and carried him out to be buried. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in and found her dead, they had carried her out, or they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon those, upon all who had heard these things. This is the way the account is supposed to read. If you'll look in your Bible as these chapters are broken up by an individual, they're, they're not really... Uh, done any justice to have to, to be divided sometimes but so many of these stories will begin with the word now and so you see in chapter 4 in verse 32 that the happening that thing that is going on the thing that you are being told about it starts here now and then the story continues you'll see this if you start looking backwards through acts back in in uh, verse 13 there's a difference in the focus of what the story is and the difference is broken up not by the numbers on the page for they didn't exist when the page was written but by the words now or other conjoining or disjointing just jointed words and when you get to chapter 5 the first word there is but meaning whatever that was and then this is like it but different there's a conjoining there and so you're supposed to keep the story going and look at what's going on not only with ananias and sapphira not only with the property that they sell and the way that they uh, treat those monies and the apostles but also whatever it was that was just before that the topic that we look at here that what the scripture is addressing it looks like we're talking about giving and so it is you can you as we looked at last week gain a great deal from this passage about our contribution and our attitude towards our contribution as you read in other scriptures and as we referenced last week god loves a cheerful giver that doesn't look like ananias and sapphira there are three individuals in this story that are the subject matter of being an example Barnabas Ananias and Sapphira 
And they all, or the three of them, or the two families, households, do the sim a similar thing. They sell property and they give money to the church. But they don't do it in the same way, and that's the thing that is contrasted between Barnabas' giving and Ananias and Sapphira's giving. Barnabas does it in a different kind of way, with a different motive, with a different attitude of heart. He's going at a different angle than Ananias and Sapphira. So the intent is indicated by the honesty of their giving, since that's what Peter points out. You have contrived in your heart. You have not lied to man, but to God. And so the story is not only of one thing, but it's also of a couple of other things, like our attitude and like of lying. Tonight we'll look at that lying aspect of it. In chapter 4, in verses 36 and 37, we, we read about what Joseph does. His name's not Barnabas. His name's Joseph. Now, they call him Barnabas because it means son of encouragement. And it's related to what he's doing here. Now, I don't know if that means that he, he gave, uh, you know, he sold a palatial estate on the island of Cyprus. And he gave, he gave a, you know, eight-figure check to the church so that those who were needy could be taken care of. I, I don't know that it has anything to do with the amount. But perhaps considering where this contrast leads, he just did it in a way that made everybody happy. It was in a way that benefited so many people. Whatever it was about it, he was very encouraging in the way that it all worked out. He would be what we might consider a platinum sponsor. You know, if you wanted to buy season tickets to anything, or if you wanted to contribute to the Rotary Club or, or you know, other civil uh, businesses or business practices or nonprofit institutions, there, there's levels for that, right? You have the entry level, like the, the Workers Club or the Blue Club or the White Club, or then you get into the, the medals, right? The Bronze Club the, and the Gold and Platinum platinum typically being the highest level, whatever it is about the way Barnabas is giving or acting, he is recognized as just being above and beyond, so much so that they give him the name Son of Encouragement. And that's what Ananias wants. Not the money, and not that the money does or doesn't matter, but what he wants is that kind of prestige. Do you see what Joseph did? Joseph gave hit money when he sold his place and, and everybody loved him for it. I want that, Sapphira. We need to do that. Doesn't that sound good to have everybody, you know, look up to us and smile at us? We'll be the Joneses that everyone's trying to keep up with. An excerpt from the New Testament commentary from Gospel Advocate written by Leo Bowles on the book of Acts. An excerpt about this attitude of Ananias reads, Ananias took the lead in this sin, but his wife knew of it and entered into the sin with him. They pretended to deliver up the entire amount which they had received for the land. His wife was fully acquainted with his purpose and agreed to join him on the practicing, in practicing the deception. The praise that Barnabas received for what he had done was too much for Ananias. He wanted to obtain the same praise, but he was not willing to make the sacrifice Barnabas made. He wanted the praise for giving all while he had given only part. And this makes sense as far as the continuation of this story. This works out quite well. Why did Barnabas give? Apparently he gave as... Uh, vetted by the Holy Spirit in a way that was just pure. And because of that, he was lauded among his brethren. Ananias, not so. I, I want that feeling. I want that praise. I want that status. But I don't want to do it in that way. And that works so many times for anything that you might want to lie about. You want people to see you in a certain way either to not see the bad thing that you have done. So you may lie about it. I, I didn't do that. 
or it didn't work that way. I didn't mean for that to happen. Or maybe it is that you would lie to say that something didn't happen. We might consider these white lies or it doesn't hurt anybody. It just keeps people from thinking negative thoughts. You know what I'm doing? I'm cutting off gossip before it starts or I'm just not letting them think negatively of me. I'll be a better person tomorrow. And so often the things that one would lie about are to change someone else's perception of what is going on. And here we see Ananias and Sapphira trying to change the perception of what's going on. I'm only giving part of the money, but I want praise for all of it. I want you to think that I'm giving 100% when in reality I'm only giving a portion. The portion that's given is not listed for us, nor does it matter. Just the fact that they wanted everyone to think they had given everything. Now, we are going to continue throughout Scripture to read of this Joseph as Barnabas. His name is kind of permanently changed. He is a son of encouragement. This is true to his nature. He is an encouraging person. He is an uplifter of heads. He is someone who is a benefit to his brethren. To his brethren. What's funny, and not funny haha, but funny, that's weird, is that the name Ananias means Jehovah has been gracious. Wait a minute. That is kind of funny, haha. Ha. The guy's name is Jehovah has been gracious, and yet he's not gracious, and that's what he's known for, giving graciously. His actions are a contrast to his very name. And so while we see Joseph's nature borne out in his name as an encourager, we see the opposite of Ananias. He is acting contrary to what his very name means. He is not dealing gracious, especially with the blessings that the Lord had been gracious to him in. He is a ruination to his own name. He is a detriment to his own name. He, he brings shame to the name Ananias because as Jehovah was gracious to him, he is not gracious to others. Ananias is not only contrary to his name, he's contrary to God himself. In Numbers chapter 23 and 19 we read, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he not said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? 1 Samuel 15, 29 in part reads, The glory of Israel will not lie or have regret. He is not a man that he should have regret and very plainly and just real simple words in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18 we we read in part it is impossible for God to lie and yet that is exactly what the one who is supposed to be gracious uh, to show the graciousness of God does in his lies it's not just that God doesn't lie it's contrary to his nature and he abhors it the ninth commandment in Exodus 20 in verse 16 is about bearing false witness. In Deuteronomy 19 verses 16 to 20, you can read of what the Israelites were supposed to do to one who bears false witness against his neighbor. He's supposed to be kicked out of the people of Israel. He's no longer one of the children of, of Israel, but he has to leave. In Revelation 21, 8, as is a terrible song written, liars go to hell. And it's just very boldly and plainly stated. Well, what about kidding? I'm just kidding. Or I'm telling a joke and I don't mean to deceive or, or I'm only doing it for the laughs and for the giggles. I, I don't mean to lie in a malicious way. Well, Proverbs 26 verses 18 and 19, and Devin can probably quote it for you. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Firebrands, arrows, and death. Proverbs also says about God and his attitude towards things that he abhors. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 
There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. God takes very seriously the words that come out of our mouths. He takes very seriously the words that we would pen. He takes very serious what our attitude of heart is, especially with those things that He has blessed us with. And so He takes very serious the intended deception of Ananias. And He does so to the glory of His name. In Acts 5 and verse 5, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. Okay, there's a punishment, but what does that mean for us? And great fear came upon all who heard of it. Sapphira comes in, a similar, things, a similar, things, a similar thing happens. She is carried out and buried. And in verse 11, great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Be very careful in how you convey things to others. What's your attitude toward lying? That's kind of a serious question. While I don't expect you to answer to me, what I would ask is, if I were to ask you about what your attitude is toward any other sin, you might have an opinion on that. What's your attitude toward murder? What's your attitude toward rape? What's your attitude toward stealing? Well, what's your attitude toward lying? Do you have one? Do you have a, a preconceived statement in your heart that would say, that's right or that's not right? I would hope it would say that, that those things that are lies are not right. They're not to be put up with. The people that do lie or people that make a habit of it, the, that, that kind of action is a detriment. It's a bad thing. And then I'm not afraid to say that lying is a bad thing. All of these fit together. The honest heart that Joseph has is an encouragement to his brothers. The dishonesty that is shown by Ananias and Sapphira does work toward the glory of God, but not in a way that lets Ananias and Sapphira see the next sunrise. Besides that, of the many attributes or monikers, rather, that Jesus is given, one of them is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says in knowing the truth, you are set free. Do you resemble the truth? Is that what comes out of your mouth when it opens? Ananias did not resemble the truth. And you can make an argument that all seven of the things that are listed in Proverbs 6, he shows, and it's manifest only for us in the way that he says, this is all the money. In the lie, in the portrayal of the lie, Ananias shows all seven of the things that Proverbs tells us God hates. We'll go back through them real quick, just in case you've already left there from your Bible. Haughty eyes. He had haughty eyes. He saw what Barnabas had, and he wanted to be a party to that. He wanted it like that. A lying tongue. Well, that kind of goes without saying. Ha ha. Hands that shed innocent blood. Now, that one's kind of hard. Hands that shed innocent blood. How did Ananias do that one? The needy saints of Jerusalem are who the contribution is being taken up for. And it is a stretch to say that someone died because they did not have the means or the wherewithal. I understand and I agree that that one's a stretch, but perhaps it points in that direction. And if not, that's fine. You don't have to condemn Ananias extra. He got all he could handle at one time from Peter. A heart that devises wicked plans. And we're told that that's how Ananias contrives with his wife to do these things. 
feet that make haste to run to evil. As far as we know, this all happens on the same day. They see what Barnabas has going on and they want a part of it immediately. At least the stories are placed back to back for us. A false witness who breathes out lies. Again, that one is kind of obvious for us. And one who sows discord among the brothers. Again, perhaps a bit of a stretch because in his actions you see more unity than disunity. And that by his actions and those of Sapphira, you have unity in the church. Great fear came upon them all. So if not all seven, perhaps at least five of the seven. Lying is not just statements that are made. It is the symptom of a sick heart. It is the symptom of an attitude of heart that says, the truth is less important than whatever I stand to gain by saying whatever it is that I will say. Speech, talking, running your gator, it's a big deal. James 3, if you would like to turn and read there, we're not going to tonight, but talks about how the tongue is a rudder and steers a massive ship. How it is a small fire that lights ablaze a forest. And how with the same mouth we should not utter blessings and cursings. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, we are told just very plain, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. It's a big deal. No matter how, how uh, let me rephrase that, no matter what your age is, it's always a positive idea to make sure that you are aligned with what God would have you to do. And when you come to a determination, I'm doing pretty good with my speech. I'm doing pretty good not using the words I ought not use or saying the things I ought not say or telling the jokes I ought not tell. Remember lying in all of those categories. Great fear came upon all who heard of it. Take your wording seriously. Ways that are, are common and typical are the use of a big word called hyperbole. I'm not going to condemn hyperbole. Hyperbole is, is typically something that is obvious. Like saying, Florida State is the best basketball school there is. Obviously, for my Kentucky family, you would take exception to that. But it would be hyperbole. It would be making a statement of overness, not to deceive, but to point out something like the increase of something or the greatness of something. We do this often by using words like always and never. I'm always on time for church and I'm never late. Well, that's not always true now, is it? Now, whatever our intention is, let us be careful and take very serious the things that come out of our mouth. And take very serious what it is that we would convey to one another as Christians, we bear the name of Christ. I made a big deal out of Barnabas' name. I made a big deal out of Ananias' name. Ananias, Jehovah has been gracious. Okay, you're a Christian. What does that mean about you? Do you act contrary to your nature? Do you act contrary to the name that you have, that you bear, that you wear every day? Or do you show the name that you bear and in so become an encouragement to others? Are you a Barnabas? Are you an encouragement to your brothers and sisters, to those about you, to those who would receive the gospel or, or listen to you for salvation? Or do the things that come out of your mouth show something less, not seasoned with salt or gracious? Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 3. Do not, from selfish ambition or conceit, 
Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. As we stated earlier, or as I stated earlier, so many times, so often, lies typically come from I want you to perceive me or a situation in a way that is not negative toward me. In ways that's a selfish way to look at things. And that whether I'm magnified and, and look good because of something, or whether I have done something that makes me look not so good, the truth does not change. And while we're all entitled to our own opinion, we're not entitled to our own set of facts. Continuing in verse 4, Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. And whether I look good about it, or whether I look negatively about it, let God be glorified in everything that I say and do. Verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is, also, uh, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. How many questions did Jesus get asked through his life? Through his death? How many times should he, should he have just answered, because I'm God? He could have called 10,000 angels. Why do your disciples do this? Why do you act like that? Who are you? And yet every answer that he gives is not bold and unapologetic, vehement, crass even, truth. But the truth that he provides is gracious, seasoned with salt, brings benefit not only to those who hear but also to us who read verse 8 being found in human form he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even a death on a cross Jesus died to bring us salvation because Ananias no not because of this guy Ananias but because Jehovah is gracious and so what will you do with that blessing? Will you use that blessing to be an encouragement to others? Or will your tongue say different things this week? Will it benefit you and you alone? Or will it benefit you and your family alone? And will it not benefit anyone else's soul? There's an oath from a movie that I really enjoy. And in that oath the father charges his son to speak the truth even if it leads to your death. So let it be that we have the attitude of God to hate deception so much that we would speak the truth, what others need to hear graciously and seasoned with salt even if it would lead to our death because our Lord has been gracious and because we bear his name let us be honest to it and be Barnabas to others. If you need to fix anything between yourself and your God, if you need to graciously accept His gracious gift of salvation, then make it known.